Welcome back to Real Talk with Susan Stone and Christina Supler. We are full-time moms and attorneys bringing our student defense legal practice to life with real, candid conversations. We're going to talk a little bit about exercise and wellness and the benefits that you might not think you're getting when you get up and go to the gym in the morning. And I know that a lot of our podcast, Christina, is dedicated to mental health as it pertains to our clients. And just that when you find yourself in crisis, you get stuck. You think it's going to last forever, whatever you're going on. And some, sometimes it lasts longer than others. But I think today we are here to talk about how to get unstuck or, to use the phrase of our esteemed guest, effectuate a trajectory change. You know, when we learned about that phrase, I sound like my 17-year-old mic drop, trajectory change. Yeah, we love that phrase. Oh my gosh, I wish I had coined it because no matter what's happening in your life, no matter how dark things seem, until it's over, you can do a trajectory change. And I'm really excited about this guest because she's going to teach everyone out there who's listening to this podcast how they can have a trajectory change no matter what the circumstances. So with that, give an inv- an intro. Sure. So today we are pleased to be joined by Samantha Pierce, who is the CEO and founder of Renegade Soul. Sam is a master's level social worker, a certified personal trainer, and a grief recovery specialist. With her background in social work, she really brings a holistic approach to her personal training. Sam designed Renegade to take care of black women of childbearing age in particular. And today she works with clients from all different backgrounds, ages, shapes, and sizes. And I have to add, I'm pleased to note that I am one of Sam's renegades. You are. <laughs> you have joined the renegade soupler. So happy to have done so. So, Sam, welcome. Pleased welcome. to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, ladies. <laughs> so, Sam, you are so much more than about just squatting and push-ups. You, Isn't that the truth? <laughs> you are about trajectory change. So could you tell everybody about how you are so much more than just a personal trainer and what you do and what you bring to those clients? Because it's, it's really incredible. It is. <laughs> it's a lot of question, really. When people ask me, what do I do? I just look at them like, well, where do you want me to start? Okay. So personal training is what I wake up in the morning and head out the door to do. But when you said trajectory change, the reason that I say that is because your life trajectory is something that we often study in social work, especially when you get a person in front of you and then you just can't look at the person in front of you. You got to look at their past and their parents' past and all those different pasts that set them on this trajectory. But we are actually really in control. So when I'm at the gym with personal client, with personal training clients, a lot of times they come to me because they want to lose weight. But sure. Literally, they have no idea that I have a whole different plan for them, right? Yeah, you're going to drop this weight, but we're going to work on, we're going to work on that gut that you're trying to lose. We're going to build arms and muscles and legs and all of that. We are also going to build confidence. We are going to work on where you are in your soul, spiritually. Like you, you just never know what you're going to walk into in the gym. On, at any given time, on any given day. How do you do that? How do you? I think that I'm very open as a person. And the conversation, I never, I am never afraid of a conversation. So I don't veer away from any conversation. Someone says, Sam, I really need to ask you this. Go right ahead because I'm an open book. But I think that is just where my life trajectory has me that I've gone through a lot of hard things in my life. And instead of being quiet about it, I'm very verbal about it. I'm very open about it. And I understand, it might be too soon to even say this, but I'm just going to say it. I understand God's plan that a lot of times things happen, but it's not to put you in a bad place, but it's to put the next person in a better place because Uh. you're ready to come 
and master this thing. You're getting ready to move this mountain so that you can teach the next person how to move that mountain. And there are people that are just watching you and they don't even need you to teach them to move how to move the mountain. They're watching you do it and they're already motivated. So things happen for a reason and sometimes it has nothing to do with you. So when we talk about getting into the gym and being able to talk to different people about different things and putting them on um, programs that will not only change their body, but also change their mind, that comes very natural to me, especially as a, I'm a, I, I call myself a recovering community organizer and a social worker. So <laughs> that's what I am. And then I use all of that energy and personal training. Sometimes I go to the gym and I have all this internal negative talk. My thighs look like this. My stomach looks like that. I'm getting old. Do you ever have that internal negative self-talk? Oh my gosh, every day. Every day. I think, I yeah, it's, and it's one of those things where you feel frustrated at times when you put in all this work or at least what you believe to be hard works because it isn't always right and don't see results. And then that affects your mind, your spirit, and it can continue on through your day. So it's something I've been working on personally is how to hold on to those endorphins and feeling good when I leave the gym and carry that through my day and not get bogged down in negative self-talk. In renegade land, you aren't even allowed to come in with negative self-talk. Nope. But how do you know, Sam, if it's going on the inside. How do you check well, that? Well, you know what? It comes, it always comes out. If you're thinking it, it comes out. If a client says, I can't do that, that's automatically self negative self-talk, right? And so before a client even comes into the gym, when they sign up, I send a welcome email and I send this link to a video that I did about I am statements and how careful you have to be with your I am statements. And Christina, I don't know if you watched that video or not, but it talked mm-hmm. about how God referred to himself as I am. And so anything that you say after I am is invoking the power of God himself. And in fact, if you say something negative, you might be just using his name in vain. So you got to be careful what you say behind I am, because when people say I can't do a thing or I'm fat or I feel fat or my stomach is fat, and it's like, no, 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 no. We're going to re we're going to rephrase that all together. So I am fat, meaning I am at the gym changing how I look because I want it to. I love that. I do, too. Sam, let's roll it back to basics. As many of our audience listeners are parents who are raising children of all different ages. So at for our parents out there who are listening, who maybe have a child who seems to be a little stuck, particularly as we've gone through COVID these past couple of years, What should parents know about the age at which children should begin exercising? Oh, that's easy. So exercising should begin. Actually, exercising does begin at crawling. Mm -hmm. They're scooting, right? They're trying to move their bodies, trying to move their legs, move their hands a little bit. That's exercise. And as soon as they start walking, they take that first step and boom, they take off. You got to chase them all around the house because now they know how to walk. I would say to cultivate that energy from that moment on, get them out into the park. They love that stuff anyway. They're going to do whatever you want to do anyway. And so I remember when my kids were younger that we would go into the mall when it's cold outside. So we're in, oh, wonderful weathered Cleveland. And Mm. (laughs) we get mostly cold weather and then three months of hot weather, right? So during the cold weather, we used to take our kids to the mall and we would just let them walk and just that's just a way of moving your body a little bit but it's never too soon to start your children on exercise and exercise looks different for everybody and it doesn't have to be regimented like that so when we think oh i got to do my cardio some people think oh i have to be on a treadmill sweating my 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 hair out in order to consider it as cardio and it's no not necessarily you just have to undo so renegade means to to subside what you thought as societal norms is regular, right? So renegade is you have to forget everything you thought you knew, right? So everything you thought you knew isn't necessarily it. So when you think about your kids and exercise, just get them out there walking, moving. And then as you become, as they become older and you become more active, they will see what you're doing and they will automatically become more active. 
But how do you fight that teenager who just wants to stay in their room? Play video games. Yeah. I remind you, you're the parent. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh you yeah. Say to them, you know what? Put the game up or you're going to lose it for the month. Mm-hmm. We're going to go for this walk. And they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the parent. Take it. Take that game away and make them go for that walk or wherever it is that you're trying to go. <laughs> Not only are you a parent, and I love how you say you're the parent, but you are so in charge when you're in the gym training. It's not just like you say, get on that machine and, you know, do that leg lift. But you also have that. I'm in charge. Go do it. (laughs) And I think that really helps, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think that something that's really important and wonderful about working with you, Sam, is this balance between go do it, but then also encouragement and positivity when there is a little like, no, no, go do it. You can do it, which is refreshing. And I wouldn't tell you to do it if I didn't think that you could do it. So here's the thing. You have to have a certain level of confidence. And so you have to find as a parent what you're absolutely confident in. And so as a parent, I know for a fact that if I don't get my kid exercising, they're going to grow up to be unhealthy. And as a parent, I'm like, oh, no, that's not going to happen on my dime. You could do that on your dime. Like when I'm long gone and you decide you're going to sit on your butt, for the rest of your life, I've already given you all that I can and I'm gone. But as long as I'm alive and you're under my care, then I am confident that if I tell you to do a certain thing, it is for your best interest and you're going to get up and you're going to do that. And it's the same way with dealing with clients like uh, Christina, grab those 20 pound weights and go lunch. And you're looking like what? And I'm like, yeah, I'm confident that you can make it down that aisle and back. And that your legs are going to be stronger and bigger because of it. So go do it. Like I said, it's the same thing as parenting. You you just got to be confident in what you're telling them. Like when you give them that Tylenol, when they have that toothache, you know that Tylenol is going to work. There's no question about it. You don't even leave room for, I don't want to take the Tylenol. Nope. Take this Tylenol. You got to have the same confidence when you're dealing with your kids and exercise. How do you balance? Because I know I struggle with this. Wanting to never, I grew up, Sam, I'm going to share something with you, where every girl I knew struggled with some level of body dysmorphia, was either throwing up or starving themselves. And then I saw a positive shift of body positivity. I was going to say that those issues were still in my generation as well, through high school and college. Everyone had some sort of issue going on. Right. Right. So you want to be body body positive, but is there a point where you're also saying to someone, you don't want to have that cookie and you do need to exercise? Like, how do you balance those thoughts? And I know we've talked about this on prior podcasts and I'm bringing it up again. So it must be a real issue for me if I'm bringing it up again. So here, okay. I don't know if you've ever talked to a bodybuilder about this. Has this conversation ever happened with a bodybuilder before? No, I have not had no. this conversation okay. with the bodybuilder. Okay. Or pediatrician. Or pediatrician. So here, yeah. here it goes. We all suffer from body dysmorphia. Every last one of us. We all have something. Especially as a so what you didn't say is that I'm a bodybuilder and that I actually compete on stage. And let's just backtrack for two seconds and let you know that in itself is one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my entire life. And that is because every bit of body dysmorphia that I've ever had is encompassed in that journey by itself. It's a 24 week journey to the stage, right? 24 weeks to get to the stage and the body does so much in those 24 weeks. So we get to eat, Then we get to do all of this cardio, all of this lifting, and then all of a sudden we begin depletion and he starts cutting everything to expose the muscle, right? So when you are dealing with how do you come away from the stage body, because to get to the stage body, you have to do so many things that is not sustainable. So Mm -hmm. the stage body is not a sustainable body. 
No way, shape or form. And I'm sure you've seen the pictures of all of the bodybuilders in the hallway. That is a body that we cannot maintain, even if we wanted to, because of how hard it is to get to there. That there is a point in the journey where we're literally eating about maybe 700 calories per day. I can't imagine how I would think. Yeah, yeah. I still don't know how I was thinking. But anyway, commitment, dedication. It gets to that point, and then you get, you hit the stage, it's lights, camera, action, and then boom, you're done. I don't know if you can think about how much of a a brain fart that could cause. Whiplash. You know, yeah. To, All of a sudden you're done. Balance. Do regular you run to people, Mitchell's? To regular people, <laughs> regular people who struggle with a cookie. So, I, and trust me, we get donuts every Wednesday in my house for the kids. It's donut Wednesday. We go get donuts before school and everybody eats donuts every Wednesday, except for when I'm on prep. And so (laughs) when it comes down to what the discipline is that is necessary to maintain, what I tell my clients is when you're beginning a journey, you need to do what you regularly do. And then as the journey progresses, you start progressing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't expect any client to come in and start training two to three times a week and then cut everything out of their diet. No, I tell them not to even change anything that they're eating. Let's get into the regimen of the workout first. And then as you progress and you want more, then you're willing to give up more. So then you're saying, eh, I plateaued. I'm going to give up. I don't know. Wine. Oh, those are Sam. Not the wine. Sam, you've struck a nerve. Oh my gosh, Sam. Anything but the wine. I'll fight you for my wine, okay? Wine and only have wine on the weekend. You're not going to have wine every night. (laughs) Oh, that got very personal. So many conversations with Susan where I'm like, it's real. Girl, you know you're not going to cut the wine. (laughs) (laughs) You never know. There may come a point in her fitness journey where she says, I can't get rid of this pudge right here. And her trainer might say, give up wine for seven days and take a picture every single day and then see what happens with your pictures and if you see a difference. And then at the end of seven days, she'll say, wow, there's a huge difference here. That's a lot of sugar. And she might say, I'm not going to drink any more wine. I'm going to switch to vodka. True story. That is exactly what happened to me. So anyway, (laughs) so the journey is the journey. But you have to be patient in any journey, not just the fitness journey, but in any journey, you have to be patient and know that evolution is natural. You will evolve into the person that you need to be in order to do a certain thing. That is how God built us. So as you progress, you'll say to yourself, Christina, one day you'll just come to me out of the blue and be like, this ain't working. And maybe I need a meal plan. And I'm going to say, Perfect. I've been waiting for you to say that. And then because only when you say I'm ready to make a change in this area, will you actually make the change in this area? And the meal plan may be something simple. Okay, what are you eating? Okay, let's do that every single day, except cut this rice at the end of the night or whatever the case may be. Something simple, but it's an evolution. And so the cookie that you struggle with is a matter of what do I want more? Do I want this cookie more? Or do I want these ads? Because if what I really want is ads, then I a cookie is nothing. I can say, I'll forego that cookie. Let me see what my body does if I don't do it. I already know what my body does when I eat the cookie. Let me see what my body does when I don't. How does this mm-hmm. mindset help college kids or kids of any age who suffer from anxiety and depression and want to turn to alcohol or drugs? Well, or numbing out with food, even or numbing out with. We can numb out with food. just about anything, but can you numb I, out with exercise? You can actually in grief recovery. I'm a grief recovery specialist. We call this it's a stir. Give me a second to pull this out of my brain. It is a temporary release of, mm-hmm. of what you're feeling. I can't pull all the the S-T-E-R-B. I can't even pull it out of my brain right now. But it's a temporary relief of whatever it is that you're feeling. And it comes out in many different ways. And exercise is one. Alcohol, definitely one. Sex, definitely one. There are so many different things that you can use as comfort, right? And so when you're talking about college age kids and, and high school age kids and 
anybody before and after, as a matter of fact. These behaviors are learned through just living. So they may have seen a parent do it that way. Uh, My parent comes home from a long day of work and what does he do? He grabs a beer. And so that's the behavior that we just learn, right? And what I would say when we're dealing with kids of any age and even adults our age is that sometimes it's it's better to sit in the feeling. And sometimes, uh uh oh, did, did I strike a nerve again, Susan? Yeah, you struck a big nerve because I know that it is so hard Mm-hmm. Just sit in the feeling because sometimes it just hurts. Feels yucky. Oh, it oh, just yeah. hurts so bad. Yeah. It just gets you and you cry. But that's and not so bad, hard, is it? But it is hard to explain to children and young adults how bad it's going to hurt when it comes back around. So you can numb this with alcohol, drugs, whatever, exercise, food, whatever it is that you're going to numb that with. But when you When the numbing subsides, you're going to feel it anyway. And it's hard to explain to children and young adults. It's easier to explain to an adult. I can say that to you and you say, oh, dang, I hadn't thought about that. But kids, that's just not going to sit with them. So a lot of times what they need is, we're talking about children and young adults, what they need is someone who can sit in it with them without the judgment. Now, are you a parent that's going to be able to sit with them? I'm a trainer that can sit with clients. So a really good example is a client comes in and she's in full-blown tears. And, you know, her, she's, I can leave if I need to. And I'm like, no, you're here. You're here for a reason. Let's sit in this and figure out what needs to happen next. And so a lot of times, so I do a lot of grief, not a lot. I do grief training, right? I have clients that come to me out of grief and their training looks different. In fact, a lot of times their training is separate from everyone else because what they need is a quiet space where nobody's around and uh, like a million reps of something that they can just say, okay, she told me to do a hundred squats. I'll never get through these hundred squats, but at least now I have something to do. And and they just start moving. Right. And I'm just standing there like this, just waiting for them to do whatever it is. They might do 20 of them. And then they'll turn around and say, was that 100? Girl, yes, that was 100. Let's move on to the next thing, you know. And that as long as you can move your body in grief and pain and things like that, it just helps. And but I know that because I am a grief person, like I work in grief recovery. I my specialty is child loss, parents, and grief. So what I- What could be more painful? What could be more painful? Nothing. I'm sure there is some things that could be (laughs) more painful, but I think it depends on who you're asking. Like, I think that the child loss has been my greatest pain, but somebody else could say that rape has been their greatest pain. Okay. It just depends on, see, child loss can happen to, to two different people and it affects them differently. Sure. And that's not to negate abortion as child loss, because that affects people differently Two people come from different backgrounds. And what they view as the most painful thing they've ever experienced is going to differ from person to person. I remember I had two miscarriages and I remember after both miscarriages, my mother saying to me, that's just God's way of making sure you only have a healthy child. And I remember thinking, that does not help. That was not helpful, mom. I know she meant to help. She meant well, but she, she did me well, but she yeah. missed the mark on that because yeah. I was grieving. Yes. And so your mom is of a different generation and they don't know how to put that into a healthy place. And grief recovery, we talk about this all the time, spiritual truths that are just not helpful. And then people, people come to you and say, God gives and God takes away. And it's, I know, but that don't help. Just like you just said, that don't help. And that doesn't mean that God didn't want me to have a, an unhealthy baby because there are children out here with autism and children with other special needs that are born and that are good. So it's not like God was just trying to protect me from a thing. It's just this just happened and now I have to deal with it. Yeah, I think different things hit people differently and generationally 
speaking, we are differently equipped to deal with certain things. Sam, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your grief recovery training. That's something I've never heard of before. And I just think it's interesting because it sounds, and please tell me if I'm wrong, it's as a combination of, in many respects, meditation and exercise in a way. And this is great because I know you may not know this, Christina and I both love yoga. So I think I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, love my yoga. I'm a yoga instructor. <laughs> yep, yep. So grief recovery is it. Now, after the twins, I have twins that passed away. They were born at 21.6 weeks and they had no chance of living because they just didn't have lung function. And they each lived about an hour after they were born and they were born on separate days. One came and then we had to induce the other. Oh my gosh. And so after that, my husband and I went to tons of counseling. We saw, we saw a group which was great. We went to photo therapy. We went to individual counseling. We did all kinds of different counseling. And it wasn't until during my work on the pregnancy and infant loss committee for the county that they brought in a grief recovery specialist. What they were doing was, and I did not know this, this they threw me into this mix, but what they were doing was they were going to make everyone on the committee go through grief recovery method. And then they were going to train us to become grief recovery specialists. So they signed us up for the grief recovery group. And I went to it as an eight week group. This one in particular was an eight week group. And I was like, yeah, I'm here for child loss, yada, yada, yada. And when I got there, we were talking about all kinds of other losses. We were talking about losses of teddy bears when I was six years old, and what that did to me and what that meant and loss of keys and job interviews and stuff like that. I'm sitting there, I'm confused. I'm just like, what, what are we doing here? And it was the most thorough. I actually called the, my, the chair of my committee and I was like, I'm not doing this. This is not what like I, I think they put me, they, I'm in the wrong group. I belong in the group down the hall. <laughs> yeah, like, what are we doing? Like, why are we talking about all these different losses? And I'm tore up from the floor up. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just gone. And she was like, no, this is accurate. You're okay. Just stay with the group. And so when I completed it, what I realized was that this was the most thorough grief class I have ever participated in. And it starts from childhood and then it takes you through a relationship. So what we say in grief recovery is that grief begins as soon as you come out the womb, right? You come out of that warm space, you're covered, you come out, it's cold, there are bright lights, you cry and some doctor slaps you on the butt and this is your intro to life. <laughs> How do you incorporate that knowledge in the renegade group you run? Oh, honey. I spot them, actually. In fact, I've had several renegades go through grief recovery method. I offer them a discount. I did a group of renegades. But when, like, for the example that I gave you a little while ago, the lady that came in absolute tears, I said, you need grief recovery, and we're going to start that next week. And I took her through the, for one-on-one -on -one in seven weeks, the seven-week program. And she was like, I didn't even realize I was dealing with all of this because a lot of times, listen carefully to this. We did not talk about this before. So this was never in the, any of the prep questions. But a lot of times you get stuck in a journey and it's related to grief. It's not related to anything else. So you think you're stuck because you want to eat macaroni and cheese in a fitness journey. But the truth is you're stuck because you've got this unresolved relationship of a person that is gone from your life, has been gone from your life for 20 years, and you're stuck in emotion that you didn't realize and that it got you not able to make other changes because this person loved macaroni and cheese. They always made it for me. And so I'm going to eat it. It was my beloved mother, whatever the case may be. And this is just a wild example. So this is not anything that has actually happened, but this macaroni and cheese is in your way of your ass. And so when we go through the grief recovery method, when we start talking about what different relationships affected you and you start working through relationships for the unresolved things that happen and unsaid things that you never got to say before they left your life, whether it was from death or just 
estrangement is it just opens up a different world in your brain of being able to deal with other things because now you can see, oh, this was compounded with that and this, and I've never been able to deal with this particular situation. And so I've never been able to trust another person with this part of me. You, It just opens you up to something totally different and a different piece and a different piece of healing that can occur. We, Christina and I deal with sex issues every day. Every day we talk to college kids about sex. We help students on their journey dealing with either defending against an allegation of sexual assault and what that feels like to be accused mm-hmm. and, or people who have been have experienced sexual violence. And we talk every day about that. I'm wondering, and we're seeing a lot of violent behaviors in the college dorm room. Mm. And I'm wondering if grief ties into sex and in the way we have sex and the way we make love with each other. Do you have thoughts on that? I got a lot of thoughts on that. I um, got you. Let's, <laughs> let's back up. I saw a study a long time ago that said that 60% This number could be off, and I don't recall where I saw the statistic, but we probably can find this somewhere. But it was something like 60% of the prison population was heavy in grief. Mm. And can we just. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Every single person that's sitting in prison and took them through grief recovery or some other grief, acknowledge their grief and help them work through whatever it is that they're grieving over and allow them to begin a healing process, how that might change, right? How about getting them before the crime is committed? If we could only get them before the crime is committed, right? Then our prisons would look totally different. But it's hard to get to people because again, grief begins at such a young age. We all have this backpack and every little loss that occurs, we add rocks to the backpack. It just becomes heavier and heavier. So when you're talking about sex, grief. Hurt people do hurt people. I hate that saying, but it's absolutely true, right? If you are a hurt person, you don't know any other behavior than to hurt the people around you. And a lot of that has to do deal with you not being able to trust the people around you. And so you cut them off and you hurt them. So when you're dealing with dorm rooms and violent sexual behavior and People, young people, young minds trying to deal with a social media, parents, siblings, school and grades and studying and parties and Greek life. I want to join a sorority, fraternity, whatever. All of this other stuff is happening. And then, by the way, I haven't healed from whatever happened to me back home before I got to the dorm room. Right. So. If you are dealing with all of that, and this is a very young mind, this is not a mature mind, you are going to need some help in placing things in the right compartment and dealing with things and healing. So even though we didn't talk about grief recovery in our preparation for this, I would thoroughly suggest that college age students, so we do grief recovery method for 18 and up, that college kids all go through grief recovery like that would almost be that should be a curriculum change actually because then you start to work through relationships all the way up until they got to 18 and then move that's a trajectory through. change that's a trajectory Tra- change. that yeah. is it that was yeah you got to start that business oh, here you go and i will <laughs> <laughs> Susan, you know me well. You haven't even known me long. (laughs) I see you. Seeds are planted. Seeds are planted. Uh And so what is traject? What is the trajectory change? It literally is seeds being planted. Hmm. Literally is. If you can plant a seed in the mind of someone else, then you can change the trajectory of the life of a young person simply by introducing a thought that something else is out there. I remember I took my my neighbor at my old house 
she thought that the world was right there in our little corner of the street, right? And so I took her with me and the children. We went to my doctor's house and she lives all the way out in Aurora. She's got this big swimming pool in her yard, you know, sauna and closed in deck. And it's like this big mansion, right? And I'm like, we're going to see my doctor. Do you want to come? And she's like, yeah, I'll come. And I took her over there and she saw this place and she was like, people live like this? This isn't just on TV? And I'm like, yeah, we don't live like this yet, but we will. Like, <laughs> this is just, you. sometimes all you need is a level of exposure to change your whole outlook on life. And if you want it bad enough, you'll change your trajectory on your own. Wow. I'm just processing that. That's I'm really... about to break down and cry. Yeah. I'm feeling very, <laughs> I'm a little verklempt. Yeah, it's a really powerful, I got to be honest, I think that's our ending thought. It's just powerful. The idea that we can effectuate our own trajectory change bit by bit, and then even more so with community around us helping to lift us up and empower us. But it so much does start from within. From within. And if it's not within and you have somebody around you to input it, that's even better. The work that you ladies are doing with these children, I say children because even college kids are still They're children. They're children. Right? Oh, <laughs> this work that go on and on. Go on and on about that. If you could just feed them positive thoughts, like they're in a bad situation, it looks grim for them. But if you could just say to them, if you can input this thought of, yeah, but God's going to use you anyway. You're going to have this really abundant life. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has for you, honey. And when they you look at that and you say, and you can give them examples of that, and you can point out people that have lived through really hard times, like start looking at these celebrities that they love so much and find out their backgrounds. Oh, well, so-and-so did this and they come from the projects, whatever the case may be. If you can overcome a thought process, and Susan, Christina, y'all think about back when y'all went to law school, there was something that made you go to law school, right? There was something there that said, this is what I'm going to do. And you showed up every single day. There has to be something in each of these children that, that makes them show up. But if you can find out what that is, then you can tap into that and you can keep them either moving in the right trajectory or changing it. This bad thing, yes, it happened to you, but doesn't have to define maybe, you. Maybe it happened for you, mm -hmm. not to you. Maybe this was an eye-opening thing that's going to change the way you affect, and I'm talking about the children, you went through this thing so that you can help change the world. Powerful thought. I, I really just think thought. about, we do a lot of talk with, especially with my K through 12 practice, and those kids who are on IEPs, Individual Education Plan, about transition planning. But we don't really, we talk about sex ed and we talk about occupational advice. Are you going to be a doctor, lawyer, candlestick maker? But we really don't prepare people for just the pain of life. Yeah. And that's what you can offer the world. And that's what you do. You are the navigator of that trajectory change once you get stuck in life. And mm -hmm. we thank you for the work you do with people. Oh, thank you. I agree. And Sam, we are so pleased that you joined us today. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. so much insights and food for thought and wisdom with our listeners. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much for having me, y'all. Thanks for listening to Real Talk with Susan and Christina. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And leave us a review so other people can find the content we share here. You can follow us on Instagram. Just search our handle, at Stone Supler. And for more resources, visit us online at studentdefense.kjk.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Real Talk community. We'll see you next time.